Equal Stages off script number three. Barry Record, Skyvers and more. Margaret Record, Bernal and Michael Record talk to Aisha Casely Hayford about the Jamaican and British playwright. Thank you both so much. It's a real, real joy, especially to be speaking all the way from London to Jamaica. I'm very interested from both of you to get your view on any differences between Barry Records' British and Jamaican reputation and legacy, if there are. I'm aware of what we're doing here in England, but you both are perfectly positioned to have a comparison. Do you have any thoughts? Well, it's wonderful to be sharing on a person who has been in our lives and actually hasn't ever left it. Because today we're talking about Barry who died in 2011 and he's still as fresh for us here and thankfully for many people in London as well. I think that where I would start is saying that through Barry and his career, it has clearly indicated that Jamaica is bigger than an island. Jamaica is a country with no boundaries because he is a person who, when we walk by the Ward Theatre downtown, which still exists today, thankfully, we Jamaicans, we family, recall 1953 and the staging of Barry's marvelous Jamaican set play, Della, on those very floorboards uh, where Michael and I were taken as cast members, as supporting crew, as program sellers, as commentators on how the audience was reacting to this stellar initial moment in Jamaican theater. That play, Della, reappeared on the London stage a couple of years later as Flesh to a Tiger with Cleo Lane, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, Barry has always been a global figure. He has been um, somebody who has taken Jamaica to the world and somebody who has brought the world of the UK to Jamaica to learn more about. A country that, um, may I put it this way, has always felt it was a global power, no matter what its size. So his reputation straddles a lot of Faces, particularly from London, um, back to Jamaica, to New York, and Canada, and back. So I don't, I think that there has been more on a technical, technical, in a technical way, more productions of Barry's work recently uh, than there, in London, than there have been here. But his name is still alive and much loved, much remembered. Now, to answer your question a little bit more directly um, about the contrast between the, or comparison between his reputation in England and in Jamaica, I go again, like Margaret, I'm going back to the beginning. Now, Barry made much more of a splash initially in England than in Jamaica, because in Jamaica, he was one of many playwrights. There were playwrights before him. There were playwrights around the same time when he started, and there were even more playwrights when he sort of um, stopped producing in Jamaica. The, the 50s into the 60s was the time when theater really started booming in Jamaica. And so he was one of a number of, of playwrights, Jamaican playwrights and, and other playwrights, because we were at that time as a nation, well, perhaps I should say as a city of Kingston, because it, the theater centered in Kingston. We were in Kingston very interested in theatre. So there was the adult drama festival going on at about that time with a mix of Jamaican playwrights and foreign playwrights. And he came into the, the, the cauldron, as it were, 
as one of the many. So he did not make that much of a splash in that particular period because of the the other playwrights who were on at the time and the the fact that the Jamaica Adult Drama Festival had been going on for a, for a bit. Um, but he was a pioneer in England, one of the really early black theater uh, playwrights. And because his plays were different, I think, and because he was different, I think the, the, the um, response was stronger at that time than it was here in Jamaica. And because he had been living there, of course, a play like Skyvers, which was set in, in London, would have made a, a huge um, impression on the audience. It not only would have, it, it, it did. Whereas his, the play that he started off here with here, Della, was, as I say, you know, one, one of many. It wasn't all that different from the other plays that, that um, were in, being produced in Jamaica at that time. And then I, I believe, I, I really wasn't in England at the time, I believe that he continued to live in, in England, continued to write mainly in England, and then he came back to Jamaica every now and then. And so because of where he was and where he continued working, I think his his the impression that he made was stronger um, in the years after he, he first, you know, came onto the scene. So, so that is my feeling at the time. Mm -hmm. Because, though, because he started making such an impression in England, yes. we in Jamaica started taking notice. It's, it's a it's a way that we tend to look at things. When our people make an impression abroad, then we start taking notice of them. It, it happened with, with a number of other, other writers, both in the music area and in acting, etc. Um, so when Barry started making a, a powerful impression in England, started becoming known there, and of course, we need to bring in Lloyd because Lloyd and he were working together as a, as a team doing things. Um, we in Jamaica started taking notice. And I remember he was invited back to Jamaica to stage the June fishing, which was a, around the time of our independence. But again, because he was, was making such a big splash in England, we started taking notice. And then, of course, when he came back here with his other plays, then his name started becoming known uh, to the general theater public in Jamaica. But it started there. Thank you so much. It's really helpful to put it into that historical context to understand kind of all the triggers and the relationships. And, yeah, it's a... It's, it's absolutely a story we're familiar with that you have to go somewhere else. I have to go to foreign. <laughs> this we know. Um, thank you for mentioning uh, Skyvers uh, there, um, Michael, because that does lead me on to the next question. I mean, obviously, that is the play that I've been looking at so closely and that we've taken some excerpts for our audio version to present. I mean, that Skyvers is set in a London comprehensive school, and it was fascinating for me, just that alone, for that to be the topic of um, Barry Record's play. And it reveals to us his experience as a school teacher, his interactions and experiences, and what that play is doing, as we know, is it's amplifying the working class voices 
in England at that time and the experiences, although it's London, that voice is for the whole country, you know. But Barry was also part of the nation's elite, both of his of the places he was from, in England and in Jamaica, and he had attended Cambridge University. I wondered if you had anything that you might share with us about what that dichot that um, dichotomy of being in that elite and then looking at these voices and trying to amplify these working voices tells us about Barry, about his character, his search for authenticity and his efforts to capture truth in his work. That's a particularly um, salient point for the family of Barry Recker to comment on because we had the the gift of always knowing him from ground zero here in growing up in Jamaica. And it's also something that as people th looking at our societies, whether it's here in Jamaica or in London or wherever, uh, and seeing the, that the problems that are still being revisited and sadly not moving towards a solution that works quickly enough for us that we we think back to Barry and his his basic character uh, and what I remember growing up is that particular empathy that Barry as a intellectual he was a, a an scholar at Kingston College who did very well, who was uh, early touted as a promising, brilliant student, which he did fulfill. He went on to get an ISSA scholarship and go to Cambridge. But he took something with him. And I always feel that the character that he had intrinsically, that was part of him, that empathy, that seeing people around him, um, being connected to them, asking direct questions, was something that made his subsequent career in teaching, in playwriting, um, in dabbling in political theory and social change back here in Jamaica. It made, it was a bedrock of his character and it made the things that he saw and chose to research, to ask questions about um, for us particularly satisfying and meaningful because he wanted to know the way forward for a lot of people. He recognized as he said that he had got a fabulous education here and then he went to England but he wanted to use that education so when he left Cambridge he went to teach in, in inner city London and the questions he asked there which unfortunately we're still asking whether we're in London of the school system or here in Jamaica, why hasn't this worked for more people? Those questions came from the way Barry used his intelligence, his education, and he used his, his, the way he went through the world. He went to ask questions that he had an empathetic and personal connection with. How do, uh, it was shown not just in Skybers, but later when he went to, to to Cuba and asked, does Fidel eat more than your father? He started at a, something that everybody, wasn't an intellectual question at all, but a gut question. And that was always Barry Recker. That was the core of who he was. And he layered and added on to that with his life experiences. And when he came back home to Jamaica, as an accomplished playwright in his later years, um, he wrote, as Michael said, June fishing, and he got on his brother Carol's boat and went in out with a fisherman night, you know, for a couple of nights to, to share their life and then to ask those questions. So for me, um, Barry was always a basic, empathetic human being who never saw differences between people, or if he saw them, he answered questions of how 
people could have more equity wherever they went in life, however they went, whatever befell them. And that was a, a sort of gift of Barry, a very basic gift that never left him. Yes, the, the matter of Barry being an empathetic person a, and a questioning person is something that always stood out for me. And those qualities, the qualities of asking questions and the quality of being empathetic, that too was demonstrated both in the Caribbean, Jamaica and Cuba, as Margaret mentioned, and in England. And it was, I think it was part of his being an, an, an artist, a playwright, interested in the, in the condition, the human condition, um, and not only interested, but wanting to show people the human condition through his writing. Um, in Jamaica, while he was at Kingston College, he started writing letters to the editor. And I have read a couple of, of the letters he wrote to the editor. Again, dealing with as I recall, the, the social conditions of the country. He wrote poetry, and I remember when he was abroad, going through the boxes of papers that he left here, reading one of his poems, written in the sort of style of Louise Bennett, but again, dealing with the, the people, the, the common people. And then um, from... from writing for the papers to writing poetry in England, he started writing plays. So he was, a, and then he went to, he went on to write the book, Does Fidel Eat More Than Your Father? So he was, he was a writer and not just a playwright. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the question though was, how was he both an elite in the United States? I'm, 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 whoa, a United States. Well, he, his, his plays went on in the United States, both, both an elite in, in England um, and, and uh, you know, a man of the people in Jamaica. That, that, was, that, was, that was him. That, that was him. He, he was um, at Boystown for a bit, and he, he would associate with the boys at Boystown. Boystown is, is our the equivalent of a boy's home, I think we could say, where um, underprivileged boys would go to live and to, to go to school. And he was interested there. And this was while he was at Kingston College, where he went on to teach. So he was also a teacher at Kingston College. Um, and I, I remember this, and this is just a little incident at Kingston College. When I was taking the entrance exam for Kingston College, Barry asked me how I was going to be writing the, the essay that they asked of, of people trying to get, boys trying to get in. And I sort of gave him an idea of how I would approach it. And he said, no, no, no. That is how everybody <laughs> would approach it in such an such a ordinary, banal, you know, run of the mill way. Do not do it that way. Try it this way instead. And my recollection is that he wanted me to start not with a sort of general statement or a general description, but start with dialogue. Start right in the in media rays, in the in the heart of things, with, with dialogue. I guess it was the playwright in him coming out. And and when he told me, I recall saying, gosh, what an interesting way to start an essay <laughs> with, with, di with dialogue, you know, not, not, not with narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it interesting. And then when I went and did the entrance exam, I, I found that I didn't know how to move on if I started with dialogue. <laughs> And being a little nervous, I went back to my old evil ways and started the same banal pedestrian way 
that I had been writing essays, you know, <laughs> up, up, to, up to that time. Fortunately, I got into Kingston College. <laughs> I, I don't know whether it was because he was pulling strings or, or what, because yeah. he, he had been a boy at Kingston College, and mm -hmm. that was where I was going in. Um, but the point is, I got into Kingston College, and because he was a teacher there, he was able to see mm -hmm. the, the essay that I wrote. And he came to me afterwards uh -oh. and said, Michael, you did exactly what I said you should not do. And shamefacedly, I said, that is true. But I, I didn't know how to move on. Eh? And so I just fell back in my old ways. So, so, so um, I, I'm not quite sure what that <laughs> anecdote shows, but but that is one of the things that I remember in in my in in, in the early life with, with with him and Casey. And I also wanted to jump in since we're telling tales out of school, because that when I describe Barry as a gift, all my life, thankfully, the, all the adults in my life, my father, my other uncle Lloyd, and my sister, and their, their sister Cynthia, the four record siblings, had a particular quality. Barry's gift to us growing up was always this business of the audacious question. That even when we were waist high as children, he wouldn't always um, say, come on, what challenge, challenge. I remember Early on, young days, when he came with his first wife, Mary, back from England after Cambridge. Um, and my mother was packing us off to, me off to Sunday school. And he stopped me at the gate in horror and said, where, where are you sending this girl? To Sunday school? Can she ask questions? And I said, of course not. I can't say a word when I... And he said, but what's the point? And he challenged my poor mother, who was taken aback about this, a tradition in Jamaica, very hallowed Sunday school, but he did it in the, the most caring way. He said, it's no good going through life and not seeing things and then asking questions about them because Barry was a change agent. He really didn't want to be the only Jamaican boy to get an ISA scholarship and go to KC or have a good education at Kingston College or spend time in London. He wanted all the Jamaicans who he knew were equally talented in their way, but had not had some of the opportunities that he had had. And I mentioned a grounding in a family, a mother and a father who were always there for the family, uh, despite some challenges, because as you can imagine in the late forties, and 50s for young Jamaican boys to want to be on, in, on stage and in theater and write was a little bit of an extraordinary career choice. But the security of the family background was there. And he said, and always did, um, question, ask questions about what you see around her, us, what hasn't changed for all our sakes, not just for his. And that's why it's interesting when you describe Barry as elite, because of all the things I've never thought of him as <laughs> is a, a, any particular remove from other people, you know, the people around him. He was part of a, a common herd. I think that's what I really wanted to get to the bottom of. And you've both really explained it so nicely, because to write how he did in Skyvers. And he has that lovely in preface where he says, look, this isn't real speech. I'm not trying to say this is how these young boys yeah. speak. But he says, what I'm doing is I'm heightening it to get to the truth. You know, and he's very clear that he says, I'm understanding what they want to say and I'm putting it forward so you can receive it. Because maybe if they're in front of you, you couldn't break different barriers no, and no. be able to communicate like that. And I was really fascinated at that um, clarity that he could get. Um, I'm putting together Barry's asking questions with the matter of Sunday school. You may or may not know that at one stage, Barry was planning to enter the, the priesthood. 
he, he, he was going to become a, a, an Anglican priest. And this was probably because of the influence of Bishop Gibson, who was both the Bishop of Kingston and the principal of Kingston College, where Barry went, where my father went, where I went. Um, so, so he actually started going to the seminary. But then, because of this the fault of his, of continually asking questions, he seems to have not been receiving the proper answers <laughs> from, from the, the seminary or from Bishop Gibbs. <laughs> and he promptly dropped out of, of, of the, the courses, the, the, the program there, and bec became, I believe, an atheist, though I don't want you to hold me to this. Maybe he was just an agnostic, because agnostics ask questions, atheists yeah. know the answers. So, but he certainly dropped out of that potential career as an Anglican priest. That's so fascinating. I can imagine for someone who's questioning life, that philosophical attraction to religion, you know, you often hear people may start there because they're questioning existence. So it doesn't surprise me that he went there and it doesn't surprise me that he left there. The other thing I wanted to underscore, having as the privilege as I have had and Michael has had of going through Barry's work, putting things together, collecting, is A, the work ethic. I remember every morning I went in, when I was in London to visit Barry at Primrose Hill in that wonderful flat overlooking the, the, the trees and the dogs patrolling the Primrose Hill Park. Barry would be at work and there would be endless paper littered. He worked, he reworked. He didn't just observe, he then went back into uh, the, the, the work mode and questioned and tried, as and you mentioned this, Aisha, tried to get the, the words right, tried to get a minimalist approach to what he was wanted to communicate. So it wasn't flowery. I mean, he dreaded the verbosity and overkill and floweriness. We want to get it simply right. And that worth work ethic, I think sometimes people think creative people just get up and burst into song or prose. Barry wrote, uh, went on to write songs, he wrote musicals, he did a lot of genre, he played the cello, he was a very versatile person, but he worked, always. Thank you, it's so important to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you both so, so much for your time. It's been so insightful and just, incredibly personal to hear so so intimately your memories and to feel a bit closer to Barry Record and hopefully understand how he and why he produced the work that he did. So from London, thank you very, very much. A real pleasure. Thank you so much, Aisha. It was a pleasure going down memory lane again. The much loved, much loved Barry. To be that was Barry Record, Skyvers and more, with Margaret Record Banal, Michael Record and Aisha Casely-Hayford.